Good morning. Welcome to Coding in the Cabana. I'm here with my co-host, uh, Gloria Pickle, and today the topic is whirly noise. Now, I'm particularly excited about this topic. Um, I'm here uh, quarantined at home, like many of you are who might be watching this all around the world. And um, I did a live stream where I implemented whirly noise. So I've done this before, but I had some technical difficulties. And so I wanted to come back and make a really short video where I just coded the algorithm, explained it, and put up a web page <laughs> so that you could um, share your own versions of this kind of noise. Now, noise is nothing new on this channel. I have covered all sorts of kind of noise, Perlin noise being the most, the, the, al the noise algorithm that I use the most, probably. Now, anytime I'm doing a noise algorithm, we've got to talk about how am I visualizing? I want to visualize this algorithm and I want to look at the noise in a two-dimensional space. So I'm going to start with a processing window, um, and I just want to set every single pixel color to a noise value. Now, just plain old noise is randomness. So let's set up and let's just do plain old noise first. In order to set every single pixel of this window to a given color, I need a nested loop to look at every single X and every single Y. Now the pixels are stored in an array and I can access it. It's just a global variable in processing that's built in with just the keyword pixels. But I don't know where exactly I need to look at. Now I'll get to that in a second. So I want to set every single one of those pixels to a given color. Let's make it just to start with some kind of uh, pink color. So what goes in here? So if I have a two dimensional window, that's let's say it's 400 by 400. And let's scale that down to four by four. Every single pixel has a index. It's a, there's a number associated with it. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There's 16 pixels total. 4 times 4 is 16. And their index values go from 0 to 15. You'll notice that 2 plus 4 is 6 plus 4 is 10. Or 0 plus 4 is 4 plus 4 is 8. So this width 4 is the offset between the index values in any given row. So there's a really nice formula that I can use, which is actually just take which row am I on, multiply it by 4, and add that to the column. So if I'm on row 0, 1, 2 times 4 is 8, plus the column 1, 1 plus 8 is 9. Or in other words, putting this in code, int index equals x plus y times width. That's the formula. Look at the index. So this would set the entire window to pink. Now if I run this, it's going to tell me, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because pickle, what did I forget? Exactly, that's right. Pickle knows. And one more step, I've got to tell it I'm done with it so it can render those pixels. Birds are really chirping today. What a lovely day it is. There we go. There's my nice little pink, beautiful window that I love. So let's change this to a noise algorithm. And pure noise is randomness. We've got this old timey, the television has no signal. And I know that you watching this are watching this on your tubular old timey television. Whirly noise is a kind of cellular noise. And the algorithm was proposed by Stephen Whirly in a paper uh, published in 1996. There's a really basic two-step process for generating the noise. First step is randomly distribute feature points in space. So what do I mean by that? I have my two-dimensional space. I'm actually going to make it three-dimensional in a moment, but let's start with just two dimensions. And I need to randomly distribute a bunch of points. So how many points did I put here? Seven. Let's start with seven points. Easiest way for me to create seven points is just make an array of uh, p-vector objects and give it seven total spots. And then initialize every single one of those points in with a random place in the canvas. Now, one of the things that you could do if you're making your own version of this is think about, well, how do you actually generate those points? Maybe they're the points along a path of some other kind of design, or you have some other algorithm to distribute them. But I'm just going to let them be totally random. Let's take a look at those points by writing another loop down here. This is a special kind of loop that looks at every object v inside of the array points. And I'm just going to actually literally draw it as a point. Let's give it a stroke. Let's make it uh, green so I can really see it and give it a kind of larger stroke weight. And there we go. So now we see every time I run this, I'm going to get a new set of points. So step one is done. Randomly distribute feature points in space. Step two is really where the noise algorithm starts to kick in. F of n of x. So x being the given pixel, x, y. So for every given pixel x, y, I need to calculate a noise value. And it is equal to 
the distance to the nth closest point. Meaning, let's start with n equals 1. So if these are all my seed points, and then I happen to be looking at a given pixel, for example, this pixel, which point is the nth closest, the n being 1, the first closest? That's this one. If I were looking at, let's say, n equals 2, well, let's say this is the second closest. Now, you might start to think, wait, this kind of reminds me of something. Let's just look at three points. I can kind of create this tiling where all the points here are all closest to this one. And all of the points here are all closest to this one. This is known as a Voronoi tessellation. And this is, a, you know, whirly noise and the Voronoi tessellation are completely interrelated. I'm actually, in many ways, doing the same algorithm. Whirly noise is gonna veer off into a different direction, but this is something I should come back and revisit. You know, how can I look at this particular problem from a computational geometry perspective? In the case of whirly noise, we're just gonna look at every single pixel and its distance to the closest uh, feature point every single point and calculate the distance between the xy and that point's xy. And let's put all those into an array of distance values. The reason why I want to look at all the distances is because I want to vary this n value. Sometimes I want to look at the first closest, second closest, third closest. Maybe I don't need them all, but let's just keep them all right now. Store them all into this array. And then, after that, I can sort the array. That's an array also. So I could write my own algorithm for sorting an array, but um, processing has it built in. If it's just an array of numbers, processing will sort it for me just with the sort function. And let's ask the question of what n do I want to use. If I want to use n equals 1, then the color, it's not going to be a random value. The noise value is from distances, n of 1, and actually, so n should be 0, because 0 is the first element of the array, and I'm going to set it to a color. Ah, not the distances. I, I want the sorted ones. <laughs> the distances were sorted, so the closest one is always at the beginning of the array. There we go. We can start to see this Voronoi-like tessellation. Let's do a little bit of a mapping. Let's say the distances range between uh, 0 and width divided by 2. And when it's really close, when the distance is 0, I want it to be very bright. And when it's far away, I want it to be dark. There we go. This looks more like what I would expect. And interestingly enough, we can do some fun things, like we can have these points move around. Them shaking like this perhaps isn't the most interesting movement, and maybe having them be bouncing balls, bouncing off the edges, or flocking together, or moving in spiral patterns, or with purlin toys. I'll let you explore that, maybe I'll come back to it later, but you can see that these points can actually move around to create an animation out of the noise. Let's look at what happens when I have a lot more points. So instead of 7, let's try 25. And there, we see the same sort of thing. We see the same pattern, but the, the cells, the cellular texture of it, their cells are getting smaller and smaller. 100. Because there are so many points now, it's not having an easy time calculating the distance to all those points, and it's running quite slow. So this is where I want to, would want to add some kind of optimization to it, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I just want to compute, compute static noise, and it doesn't matter if it takes a long time. So I'm going to get rid of this idea of an animation. I'm actually, in fact, let's just comment out drawing the points entirely, and let's write no loop here. So. There we go. So I can see here is a very basic visualization of whirly noise. It looks quite like the example here on the Wikipedia page. Um, obviously, that page it has it darker, closer. So if I changed it to this, and I'm not getting that full brightness because the points are all so close. Let's just manually come up with a range here. There we go. I have now created basically exactly what is on this Wikipedia page right here. Now remember, the idea of whirly noise is that I have this additional variable n. So I don't just have to map the noise to the distance of the closest point, which will give me the Voronoi-like pattern. I could also calculate the noise value based on the distance to the second closest point, in which case an n of 1. And look at this. I have this almost more like crystal-like structure to it. What happens if I change it to n of 2? n of 3. 
change the mapping to allow for a larger range of distance. So you can see there's lots of different kinds of textures that you could generate based on how you manipulate that mapping, how many seed points you pick, as well as which value of n you're using. But I have missed something. So whirly noise, even though we're looking at this sort of two-dimensional visualization of it, those feature points could actually exist in three dimensions. So I could think of a cube in three dimensions, pick a whole set of initial feature points, and then look at a slice inside of that cube. To do that, let's add a z value to the p vectors. I'm keeping everything in square dimensions because I think it makes things a little bit simpler here. So it really actually doesn't matter that I have a width and a height. Everything's 400. So let's keep the z values also between 0 and 400. I'll just use width arbitrarily there. This distance is no longer between an x and y and an x and y. It's between an x, y, z and an x, y, z. And just to make this read a little bit easier, Let's put the particular point that I'm looking at in a variable, v. And let's also add a z. So now I'm looking at the distance between two points in three-dimensional space. I have my feature points, the x, y, and z of the given feature point, and then the x, y, z of the given pixel I'm looking at. But again, I'm looking at a slice, so z is constant. So I'm going to make up a z value. Let's just look at the center slice, width divided by 2. Um, let's change n back to 0 so I look at the closest point and see what this looks like. Not too different, right? Can I quickly see the difference? I'm going to just say if mouse pressed d equals, let's just look at that 2d distance. Let's allow it to animate. So you can see here when I click the mouse, there's a lot more cells. Let's see if I use fewer feature points if this is maybe a bit more obvious. So that's the 3D, that's with the feature points in 3D, and this is within 2D. So we can see there's a bit more of a spherical kind of quality to them. It's a bit smoother, the noise texture. Let's go back to about 50 points. Um, let's stick with 3D. Let's look at uh, n equals 1, n equals 3. Now, something that I could try that's pretty interesting here is I could vary the z. So for example, I could look through what does the noise space look like at any give distant different slice. So what if I had uh, z just be frame count modulus width. So at every frame of animation, I'm looking at a different slice. When it gets to the top slice, it goes all the way back down. Let's set n at back to zero. You can see it's slowly animating. It's as if I'm scanning into this three-dimensional space. One thing I could try here just to add a little more flair to this is I could use a different n for an RGB color. So I could have the red value be tied to n equals zero, the green to n equals one, and the blue to n equals two. Let's see what happens there. So let's actually call this r is sorted zero, g is sorted one map, and b is sorted two. And then the color is RGB. You know, I could also play around with varying the ranges, and I could have this go 255 down to zero. And maybe the blue value, change this to 200. <laughs> A lot of possible kinds of colors and textures I could create just from varying the, how I map the ranges, which distance I use. Um, but here we go, we can see this is basically the foundation upon which you could create your own animation or texture with whirly noise. So what might you want to try with this? A couple things. One is, um, this is running pretty slow. Um, I'm able to, to get this at a reasonable frame rate at 400 by 400, but this would really merit some optimization. One optimization would be to improve on how many points you need to look at for every given pixel. So you don't need to actually look at all of the feature points for every given pixel. We can register the points into given cells into the window and only look at a few of them. And I've covered this topic uh, extensively in my quad tree videos, but you can even use a, a sort of simpler, just like spatial subdivision without the quad tree whole thing itself. Otherwise, just the rendering is quite slow having to do this calculation for every single pixel. Um, there's a really nice resource um, called The Book of Shaders, and it has a tutorial write-up about how to compute whirly noise with a WebGL shader. Um, it's called The Book of Shaders, so I'll link to that in the video description as well. So 
I look forward to your own versions of Whirly Noise. I'm gonna leave you with a rendering that I made during the live stream when I first coded the Whirly Noise algorithm. Uh, it didn't, this didn't run originally in real time. It's 1920 by 1080, computing the noise space in that sort of in, with that resolution. But using save frame in processing, it was pretty easy to render out every single frame and just let it run, save it, and export it to a movie. So I'll link to the time code in the video description where I created this. And hope you enjoyed this delightful day of coding Whirly Noise in the cabana. I'm gonna go outside, play with Pickle a little bit, and water the plants. Come on, Pickle.